worshiping our God through the beautiful gift of music that he has given us. To the cross I
Oh, my God. 
The year was 1990. I had uh, taken Margaret and we had moved from Lost Creek, West Virginia to Westerly, Rhode Island. It was in July of that year. It was a little bit different than living in West Virginia, but God bless and uh, you know you go about doing the same thing that you've done for a number of years. It was in November of that year that I was headed from Westerly, Rhode Island to Hope Valley, Rhode Island to visit one of the ladies in our church. Now, November can be a very dicey month uh, in Rhode Island because there might not be any snow, but the temperatures can be fairly cold. And it was raining that particular morning. And so I was driving my little pickup truck and not really going fast. You don't go fast in New England. I came up over this rise in the road and all of a sudden I had no control of my vehicle at all. I hit a whole stretch of black ice. No matter what I did, I tried pumping the brake, it didn't make any difference. They tell you to steer into the skid, that didn't even help. I had lost complete control. My truck did two 360 degree turns and eventually ended upside down in the ditch. And so I crawled out of the window because the doors wouldn't open because it's in a ditch and surveyed the damage to my vehicle. Our church in Rockville, which I had the pleasure of also co-pastoring, in January of 1991, had a birthday party for me, and on my cake was a vehicle that was upside down. They'd taken a car and turned it upside down, and uh, wrote on this cake, Happy Birthday, Pastor Crash. <laughs> I lovingly carried that name for the entire 16 years that I was in Rhode Island. What do you do when there's nothing that you can do? I couldn't do anything, no matter what I did, no matter how I tried to pump the brakes, no matter how I tried to turn the wheel, I had no control at all. Do you ever feel like that sometimes in the world in which we live today? That you somehow have lost control. And no matter how much you plan, and no matter how well you plan, things just seem out of control. Well, it's nothing new because every generation, people feel that way. Every generation, imagine the disciples at the time of Christ. They had put everything that they had upon Christ. They had left their livelihood to follow him. And yet he allowed himself to be taken prisoner and to be crucified. I am sure that the disciples felt at that moment in time, those days, that there was nothing that they could do, that they had lost everything. So what do you do when there's nothing that you can do? You hold on and you pray. And that's what I did that November day in 1990 as I was careening down that road and doing those donuts. I was hanging on and praying. One of the things that I've learned is this, that when there is nothing that I can do, that my attitude is an 
as an important weapon for me. I didn't panic, although there is a certain amount of panic that goes along, you know, with any change that comes in our lives. People panic when they lose their job or when they're going to a new job. When they retire, I know of people who have panicked. What am I going to do? I've gone to work all these years and so forth, and now I'm not going to have anything to do. And yet later on, what I find is as I talk to those people, they say I'm busier now than I was when I was working. So I'm not sure I want to retire. Amen? Amen. But sometimes life gets overwhelming. It got overwhelming for the disciples. It got overwhelming for the nation of Israel. If you can imagine being in captivity, to having not just your place of worship, not just your home, but your entire country taken away from you. You are in exile. You are being held captive by those who do not share the same set of values that you do. Scripture says this, as I want you to turn to Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. In the New Testament, we find this passage. If you are of Christ, you are of Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. Now what that means to me is that I can go back and look at the promises that God made to the nation of Israel and claim them as my own. Because I am of Christ, I am of Abraham's seed, and I am heirs to the promise. I am an heir. You are an heir. If you are of Christ, you are an heir, not just to all of the things that Christ has, but all of the promises that God has given to us. Amen. And so here's the nation of Israel in captivity, and I want to share with you four things this morning. Those uh, things of what to do, what to remember, when there's nothing you can do. Go with me to the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, first seven verses. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. Do not fear. Did you catch that? That's the second time he said that. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. To the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. <clears throat> What's the first thing that Isaiah says, or that God says through Isaiah to this nation? Remember who you belong to. That day as I went down that road and my truck was spinning and I didn't know where I was going to end up, the first thing that entered my mind was, Margaret, what is she going to do without me? But I was not fearful for my own life. Why? 
Because I belong to God. Now, it, it's strange that that thought came to my mind, but it's as clear today as it was back then. You and I need to understand that when it seems like there's nothing that we can do, we can always remember that we belong to God. That it is God who created us. It is God who formed us and fashioned us in our mother's womb. And he also said, it is I who have redeemed you. Even when they're going through captivity, that's in the, in the tense that has already occurred. It's something that God saw, something that God was going to do for them. I have redeemed you. Even in captivity, I have redeemed you. When you and I come to the place in our lives where, where there just seems like there's so much stuff coming into our lives, we need to remember that we belong to God. That it is God who formed us. It is God who fashioned us in our mother's wombs. It is He who has His hand upon us if we belong to Him. Amen? Amen. That ought to be an encouragement to us. The psalmist says, you know, the Lord loves us. What can man do to me? What is it that comes against us that can keep us or can keep God from us? What does it say in Romans? What can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Can life, can death, can peril, can, can the sword? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Why is that? Because we belong to Him. God doesn't change His mind about us. We change our minds so many times about Him. Well, God's never going to be able to do this. This that is ahead of me is just so big so magnificent that I'm never going to be able to get through it. I was with a family just a week ago, and they were facing a $140,000 debt for hospitalization for his mother. And they just looked at me and they said, we can't, we can't do it. We're going to lose everything. What do we do? Hang on and pray. But I said, remember this, that even though, and this came as a surprise to them, remember I said that this is not a surprise to God. God knew that <clears throat> this was going to happen. And then, of course, the question comes, well, why didn't he stop it? Well, that's really not the question. The fact of the matter is it did happen. And so what are you going to do about it? Well, the issue is still not settled. But it just seemed like when they got the notice that, that they owed this amount of money, that everything everything, it was over. Their lives. We're never going to be able to get out of this. We're going to lose everything. Well, I found out that they're not going to lose everything. It is manageable. There were some errors made and they're going to be able to handle it. It's not done yet. But I had the opportunity to say to them, you know, God knew that this was going to happen and he's already put in you the ability to handle it. Remember in, in scripture it says that there is nothing that comes against us that God does not provide a way out. That God does not provide something for us so that we can handle whatever mess we get into. Whatever that unexpected thing is that comes against us, 
we find within us the capacity to get through it. Why? Because we belong to God. Amen. And he says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Remember in Matthew, the, the illustration about the birds of the air and the, the fields and how they're clothed. And, and he says, won't he much more take care of you, O ye of little faith? You and I need to remember that God is not just some mystical being out there. <clears throat> he is our God. He's the God who created the world. He's the God who created the universe. And I don't believe that we even know yet today the expanse of the universe that he created. I think it far surpasses anything that our feeble minds can come up with. And he loves us. He said to the nation of Israel, I called you by name. You are mine. In verse 1. And so he loves us. He cares for us. Remember that we belong to God. He doesn't turn his back on his own. When circumstances happen that are beyond our control, he doesn't say, well, finally you're getting what you deserve. Instead, he says, you belong to me. Remember that. You belong to me. Say it with me. I belong to him. I belong to him. Secondly, he protects us. Boy, there are those times like that when my vehicle is spinning out of control that I needed to really realize that God protects us. Take a look at verse 2. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Isaiah doesn't say to the people, God has promised that you'll never have to go through those. You'll never have to go through deep water. He doesn't say that, does he? It says, when you go. And so you and I need to understand that there are some times that we're going to walk through deep water. And it's going to seem like the waves are going to overtake us. But he says, you may walk through the deep waters. You may walk through the fire. But you're going to come out on the other side. Remember these words in Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We don't go around things. I mean, we're humans, and we live in a fallen world, and so we're going to confront over and over and over again, every day of our lives maybe, those things that if we allow them to, are going to overtake us. They're going to swallow us up. Rivers, water, and fire. God's able to protect us. He's willing to protect us. He's faithful to protect us. Amen. He is present to protect us. Remember, God is not the source of your problem. He is the solution to the problem. Whatever the problem is, he is the solution. And so he protects us. Why does he protect us? Let's go to the next verse. And verse 4. In verse 4 he says this. Since you are precious to me, in my sight, since you are honored and I love you. Why does he do all of this? Because we are precious to him. You and I are precious to God. Amen. Doesn't make any difference what your 
racial background in it, doesn't make any difference what your economic background, doesn't make any difference. God loves us. We are precious to Him. Can I get an amen? amen. And isn't it good to know in this world where of, of cast away, you know, we cast everything away. I was with uh, a couple here not too long ago, and they said, we have a, a tape that we'd like to show you, but our VCR is broken. I need to get a new one. Well, that's true, because it's going to cost more to get that VCR repaired than it would be to go to Walmart and buy a new one. We live in a throwaway society. We live in a society where when something breaks, you just cast it aside. The unfortunate thing is that that also happens in relationships. Rather than working at relationships, what do we do? We cast them aside. And so since that is the norm today, in our world, we also think that it's normal for God to do that same thing. I don't know how many people I've talked to that said, you know, when I get my life together, then I'll go to God. Well, God doesn't want you to wait until you get your life together. He wants you to come to Him when your life is in shambles so that He can put it back together again. Amen. You understand that? Why? Because every person is precious to God. If you belong to Christ, you are heirs of the promise. You are of Abraham's seed, and this promise is for you. You are precious to God. Amen. I am precious to God. doesn't matter how I look. It doesn't matter how I dress. It doesn't even matter how I smell. I am precious to God. And you and I need to understand that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lastly, I believe that God, let's look at verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory. Everybody say, for my glory. For, my glory. for, God's, glory. for God's glory. Whom I have formed, even whom I have made. There was a saying not too many years ago about God doesn't make any junk. And it's absolutely true. And there is within each of us an amazing potential that many of us have not even realized. That we don't think we can achieve. And yet, God is created because He loves us, because we are His, because we belong to Him, because He has redeemed us. He has put himself in us, and with that comes the potential to do far more than we can even think or imagine. That's what it says in Ephesians 3.20. Through Christ we can do more than we can think or imagine. Philippians, Paul said, I can do some things. No, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The potential is amazing. I keep reading because I'm, I'm kind of a techie. And so I keep reading about all this technology. And I was reading an account, the new iPhone that came out just yesterday. People stood in line for the iPhone. Anybody here do that? Because I don't want to step on anybody's toes. <laughs> There may be those that will watch us on the internet, watch me on the internet, that may have stood in line. I know our stepdaughter did. She stood in the rain to get the new iPhone 5. And she didn't get the, she didn't want the gold one, she wanted the blue one. And so she called last night to let us know that she had the new blue iPhone 5. And I'm going, okay. I didn't do it. I've got an iPhone 4. I'm perfectly happy with my iPhone 4. I am not planning, at this moment anyway, I'm not planning to go to the iPhone 5. Although I've been looking at the Galaxy. They're a little bit bigger. Right? But you understand. So I keep looking at these things, and I, I keep thinking about, and I keep reading about, 
all of the advance, advancements in technology. Where would we be if nobody saw the potential for those things? What would have happened if, if the man who, who started cell phones didn't see the potential in that? How about computers? How about electric lights? How about all of, how about our automobiles? I, I, I heard that there's an automobile that you cannot, cannot unlock any of the doors until the driver gets in and sits down on the seat. There's a sensor on the seat. Only then can you unlock the other doors. Hmm. You know the first thought that came to my mind? Something else to go wrong. <laughs> you know, amen? Amen? I don't have any, you know, handles inside my car door to turn the window down. Well, what happens if all of a sudden I get, you know, I drive into a, a rainstorm and I get swept off and the battery shorts out and so forth and I can't get out? My doors are locked. How am I going to get out? You belong to me, God says. I have redeemed you. I love you. You're precious to me. No matter what happens, I'm going to protect you. But I thank God for potential. And I look to see potential in people. To look and see maybe what it is that God is, is causing us to do. Causing you to do. What new innovation is going to come into your mind that is going to be able to help maybe millions of people? I believe that there is so much potential. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory. In other words, you and I were created for the glory of God. And what you and I do should be done for his glory. <clears throat> Whatever it is. But amazing potential is within us. If you and I will only see be on the lookout for those moments, those things that come into our lives that may open up new avenues <coughs> for us. There's a difference between a believer and a non-believer when it comes to tragedy. I have done a number of funerals over my years of ministry. I have done funerals for believers and non-believers. And there's a stark difference. There really is. For the believer, for those who have their faith in Christ, those who are grounded in their faith, those who understand that they are precious to God. I remember one man, an older gentleman, his wife had passed away, and somebody came up to him and said, I'm sorry you lost your wife. And he said, I didn't lose her. I know exactly where she is. And he was able to walk through that valley. He was able to walk through that tragedy in his life. And able to walk through it and get to the other side. Doesn't say he doesn't miss his wife, didn't miss his wife until the day he died. But he didn't stop living because of that tragedy. Amen? Amen? Let me share something with you also about valleys and mountaintops. I believe that God gives us mountaintop experiences. One of mine was this past week when I, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I was in Oxen Hill but I was at a men's conference. I was with some men that I knew and I made new friends. I was able to talk with <coughs> national leaders. Uh, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, Barry Black, was there. 
and spoke, and I had an opportunity to speak with him uh, after he spoke on Monday night. Uh, the chaplain, Ray, Ron Hairston, who's the chaplain of the uh, Ravens, was there Wednesday morning, and I had a chance just to, to talk with him, both men, powerful speakers. We had the executive director of the uh, Family Research Council out of Washington, D.C., who came and spoke. And these are national people. These are people who have a voice nationally. And this is what I understand. I love being in that situation. I love being there. That was a great time. I mean, that was a mountaintop experience. The only thing that would be better, I think, would be like Peter, James, and John went to the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ. And you know what happened there? Peter, impetuous Peter, says, boy, it would be nice. Just, I'm going to build three houses and we're just going to stay here and group because this is cool. You know, we're on this mountaintop. The Lord is here. Moses and, and Elijah are here. And we're here. And everybody else is down there. Let's just stay here. But before the words even got out of Peter's mouth, you can check it in Matthew. It says that Moses and Elijah disappeared and Jesus was leading them back down into the valley. Mountaintop experiences are great, but ministry happens in the valley. That's why, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you may walk through the deep water, you may walk through the fire, those are all valleys. They don't sound like mountaintop experiences to me. But what God said to the nation of Israel and what he would say to you and me today, you and I live in an uncertain world. But we belong to him. We belong to him. He loves us. He's going to protect us. We're going to get through the valley of the shadow of death. We're going to get through that deep water. We're going to get through that fire. Because we are precious to Him. And in doing so, He wants to release the potential in us for His glory to bring the gospel to whomever, whoever we come in contact with. Not because of what we've been through, but in spite of all of the challenges and all of the, maybe even heartache. We belong to God. He will protect us. Now we know that one day, we're going to pass from this life into the next. But twice in that passage he said, do not fear. <clears throat> uh, you belong to me. I love you. You're precious to me. I've redeemed you. And there is so much potential. Why? Because it is God who created. Don't ever sell yourself short. Don't ever sell your children short. Don't ever sell your neighbor short. Because if we are in Christ, we are of Abraham's seed. So what do you do when there's nothing that you can do? When you're in a situation that just seems you've lost control, you, then there's going to be no way out of it. Remember this. Though you may walk through the deep waters, the waves will not overtake you. Though you walk through the fire, the flames will not consume you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff to comfort me. Hang on. 
Hang on to the hand of Jesus Christ. Pray. And allow him to work in us for his glory. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray.